All right, so tonight's lecture is by Dr. Andrew Starr. He is the medical director of the Orthopedic and Spine Institute at Abington Jefferson Health, and he specializes in total hip and knee replacement surgery. Dr. Starr sees patients at our Willow Grove, Chalfont, Doylestown, and Blue Belt offices. Okay, very good. Well, thanks so much for having me tonight, and I really appreciate those who've signed on to learn a little bit more about some of the newer technologies that we see in joint replacement. I'm gonna share my screen for a minute, so just bear with me while we do a little work here to put up some pictures. And I'll get that going for us here. And so once again, thank you so much for signing on tonight. We're going to be talking about joint replacements and specifically tonight we'll probably talk about knee replacements more than anything, just as the leading example of where technology and uh, joint replacements have come together. So I wanna thank everybody for tonight. Uh, I would really appreciate it if you would send in your questions because we'll take a few minutes at the end. And my goal tonight is to do a lot of this with video. So you get to see some things, but there'll also be a number of independent uh, slides to kind of get some background. As always, uh, this is my opinions tonight. Uh, I work at, at the Rothman Orthopedic Institute and a lot of what I do here is popular with many of our surgeons, but you shouldn't view this as something that is uh, medical advice tonight. This is informational only, and uh, I think that that's something easy to understand. I do work for several of the companies that are involved in robotics and joint replacements, and so you should bear that in mind. The other thing is we specifically didn't use any patient material tonight. So what you're going to see are, mo are models. Anything you see on the screen will be plastic. You're not going to see anything with blood. Uh, we know that for some people, they don't really want to see things of that nature. So this is all models and they're good examples, but nothing more than that. So this is one of the things I always love to look at, which is today's language, you know, on the internet or on social media. So I do Google so because because it's easy. And the other night, I Googled the expression minimally invasive knee replacement, and I got over 8 million results in less than a second. And robotic knee replacements, you only get 6 million results. So obviously, both of these are things that a lot of pa patients want to know about and a lot of people are talking about. Uh, there's another concept out there in terms of the language of muscle sparing joint surgery. And if you do that, you get over a million uh, results in less than a second. So we know a lot of people are talking about this. We know this is something that uh, many on the line tonight, I'm sure, are interested in. We're gonna specifically talk about robotic replacements as an example. Now, I love the internet and I love social media. And the thing you have to understand about it is, if you really understand what it is, you can put anything you want on the internet. There's really very, very little oversight of what's on the internet. So as a physician, some of our doctors get frustrated when they see that there's patients coming in with pieces of paper talking about what's on the internet. But I think it's a good way to start the conversation. But understand that what you see on the internet is not always true, nor is it meant to be educational. A lot of it's advertising, a lot of it is people's thoughts and feelings. Many, much of it is not proven. And even things that are proven, what's proven today often changes tomorrow. So I think that's something you have to bear in mind as physicians. We are used to this. I think you should feel comfortable talking to your doctor about things that are on the internet because it's a good way to learn and a good way to uh, develop your questions. But you have to look at it like you'd look at any advertisement in a skeptical fashion. So just beautifully on, uh, on knee and hip pain, there's a lot of causes for why people have hip pain. Clearly osteoarthritis is a very, very common cause. It's the thing we see the most in our practice of joint replacements. But you can have overuse injury. Our sports colleagues see that. We have trauma surgeons, and so we see a lot of fractures. Certainly many people with rheumatoid arthritis, things like that. And even just people who have joints that are going bad because their mothers did or their fathers did or their brothers did. So there's a lot of reasons you can have knee and hip pain. And certainly we see a lot more knee and hip pain today due to arthritis because people are living longer. They have more active lifestyles. They place higher demands on their joints. And truthfully, there's a lot of obesity out there. So 
you know, these all contribute to why people get arthritis. And it's something that there are things you can do about this in terms of healthy, active lifestyles and keeping your weight down. But, you know, some of it is just if you live longer, you're going to have more arthritis. So what does it look like, arthritis? So the picture on the left is a typical drawing of arthritis. And the white areas are the cartilage. You have the bone here, but also the bone is being exposed through the cartilage. You should never have that. And it's kind of like your tires. There should always be tread. If you lose the cartilage, you're losing the tread on your tire. Now, as an orthopedic surgeon, we certainly see this in, a, in the operating room, but we also see it on the x-rays on the right. So the leftmost x-ray is a normal knee with a good space in between the bones that's occupied by the padding, also known as cartilage. The knee on the right actually has lost the cartilage. And if you look how white it is in between, that's the lost bone, actually. The bone is reacting to the rubbing of bone on bone. It's actually wearing away, but it tends to get harder and more brittle on the surface, and that's what that white color is. So that's what arthritis is. We're going to talk specifically about knees today. Why did I pick knees? Because as I mentioned at the beginning, knees are the area where there's the most research and the most experience in joint replacement on the latest, although it certainly involves other joints as well and it will increasingly involve other joints. So this is a typical knee replacement. This happens to be obviously from one particular company, uh, but, it, but they all pretty much look the same. So you have a metal piece on the top, often made of cobalt chromium, which is a very, very bio-friendly metal. And you have a plastic piece made of polyethylene in between. And then on the bottom, you have either a titanium or cobalt chromium tray. And this is put into the joint and the plastic substitutes as the cartilage and the metal covers the surface and creates a smooth surface for the plastic. So the goal of a replacement is to put that cartilage spacer back in, which we can't really do very well. So we have to put in the plastic to substitute. And this is what it looks like on a knee bone. These are plastic, as I told you at the beginning of the show. Uh, so basically, excuse me, basically you have the metal covering the bone top and bottom and the plastic in between. And this is where it creates the padding in between the bones that the patients enjoy because it doesn't hurt. And if you look at it on an x-ray, it looks the same. You have the metal top, the metal bottom, the clear space in between is the plastic. And if you look at this other white color underneath the tray, that's the glue. Most of our knees are glued in place. We can put them in other ways. That's for another talk. So that's a knee replacement. So if we have these great knee replacements, why would we consider doing something different? Why not just do what we've always done? And there's, there's obvious reasons for that. And you know, it's kind of like visiting the desert. Everything can look fine one minute. And the next thing you know, a sandstorm comes up and suddenly you realize it's not as good a place as you thought it was. So this is an article about knee replacements. I'm not here to teach you about articles on knee replacements, but the thing to understand is this is a 10 year review in Australia of how their knee replacements did, and only about 80% of their knee replacement patients were fully satisfied. So if you think about that, if a joint replacement surgeon in the United States who's busy does five or 600 replacements, so maybe they do 10 a week, that means two patients per week will not be truly satisfied in their joint replacement. That's an awful lot of people sitting in doctor's offices saying, I had my knee replaced and it's not really as good as I would like. Many of them are doing okay, but they're just not really satisfied. So that's not good enough. So we need to find better ways. So this is one of the things this is where, the, where things have been heading toward more advanced technology. So how have we done knee replacements for the last 50 years or 60 years that they've been available? And the basic way we do it is we do a lot of measuring. So in this leftmost picture, you can see the muscles in this. This is a model. This is a plastic bone. 
And you can see we have all these devices for making measurements on the bone and measuring the thickness. You see there's this little pin you can use on the top and that's gonna read on this scale here. And you really look at it and you realize how primitive it is. Here's another one of the same types of devices, same model, and they've drilled a hole in the bone to get the alignment. And then they leave this, this jig on the top and we take a saw and cut through it. It works. It's very successful to about 80%. And it's a good way to put knees in. And we put literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of knees in this way per year. Probably about 70% of the knees in this country are still done in this way. And it's a good, successful procedure. And we finish it up by gluing it in place. You can see the glue here. You can see the metal component going in. Here's the top part. We hit it in place. And then we're done. Let me show you what this looks like on a video. So here's one of these measuring devices on one of these fake bones. And you can see at the top, there's a slot we're gonna cut through. And as we watch this video, we'll see that we're gonna make lots of adjustments. We can pin this in place. Then we can adjust the, the slide or the, the angle of the tray. And here you see the doctor measuring with his fingers and trying to figure out if we got the bone lined up evenly with the bone that's underneath the skin. That can be a little difficult. We can slide back and forth to center it on the bone. You know, and we basically eyeball this. We have the guides. They're very, very helpful. And most times we can get this knee within about three degrees of where we'd like to. So you'll see we're just kind of finishing this process. We put our caliper on the top. We make a number of measurements we can slide this piece up and down. You'll see us doing that here. This locks the slide. Just continuing to watch this here and get an idea of how a knee replacement goes. And then we take our saw, cut through the slot, and remove the piece. And then we're not quite done. We have to check that we made a good cut. So we take this, these plastic pieces with these shims, put them in there, And next you'll see it go in between. So we can judge the thickness using these various thicknesses of shims and the size of the implant. People often ask me, do you have different sizes? We have dozens of sizes. And this block will fit in there and it corresponds to a particular size implant. And then we drop rods through it and we see if it's lined up. So this is the way a knee replacement is done today. So the question is, what does robotics do for us? Would a robot do this better? And so robots have been around in orthopedics for actually quite a number, actually more than a couple of decades. There was efforts to make a robot in Europe years ago. It, it wasn't really too successful. And so the newer ones are, have been better and we're working on making them, you know, what we consider to be state of the art, but maybe not yet. So let's talk about new technology. So you're sitting in the office with your orthopedic surgeon and you go online and you see some new prosthesis that you're going to use, you'd like to have that put in your knee, or in this case, I show a hip. Well, you know, you have the standard, what we call the old technology, with known outcomes. We know they work 80% of the time. Maybe that's not as good as we would really like, but we know that that's what would happen if we do this. Then we have new technology that we hope is better. It seems like a good idea based upon the, um, the studies and the research that may have been done in the laboratory and maybe a few cases, but it may be worse and in some cases it may really be terrible. So that's the choice that a patient and a doctor needs to discuss when they're looking at new technology. And I don't care whether that's a new joint implant, a new surface, maybe a plastic that's supposed to last longer, or maybe it's a new robot that we're going to use to adjust or judge the joint. So we need to do these newer prostheses and, pro and, and techniques because we need to try new things in order to make progress. But the question is for an individual patient, is this something they wanna be a part of? And sometimes we get a little too caught up in what we'd like to do rather than what's best for the patient. And the patients get caught up in having the latest technology. So I had a patient years ago who came to me because they had gone to a doctor who did a custom total hip replacement 
which was actually measured and manufactured in the hospital in order to create an implant that was gonna fit the patient better. And this is years ago, it's not even on the market anymore, but she was 32 years old when she had it. She picked the latest technology, and six years later she was in my office to get it taken out because it had failed, and it turns out it wasn't perhaps the best idea. <clears throat> so here was somebody who wanted the newest technology because she was young and felt that she was gonna do the best that way, and in fact, it was not successful. So we have to be careful that we don't emphasize process or things that are satisfying because they seem like they're right, but in fact may or may not work, with outcome, which is the true result, how long it lasts, how patients feel about it who've already had it, do they get back to activity more quickly? So these are very important parts of evaluating new technology. Now I've been involved, as many of the Rothman Institute physicians, in newer techniques and newer technology for over 20 years. And I will tell you, we've had things that have worked better and things that have not. So I, I really do think we need to do this to prove what's best, but it doesn't mean that everybody should have it today. And this is a good example if you listen to the news or you watch TV on Saturdays and look at the advertisements. These are the metal on metal hip replacements that many of us used 15 years ago and ultimately were taken off the market because they were not working properly. And many of them actually had to be removed much to the unhappiness of the patients who had them. So we need to be careful. So what's our goal? <clears throat> our goal is not just to make a robot that can make a better cut. It's really to find the proper positioning and the proper way to put an implant in by aligning it and balancing it properly so the patients feel better. And one thing that's very important is that many of these high-tech devices may make a better cut, but they don't necessarily change how the patient feels, or at least we don't know yet. And certainly they cost more because the technology is expensive. We can see that in the United States today, this graph reflects the use of technology in joint replacements over a 10-year period. And you can see if you go from left to right, both in terms of hospitals and in terms of the way the patient's insurance is, we're seeing a tremendous increase in the amount of technology used for a joint replacement, uh, really in the early stages, because this only goes up to 2015. So these things sound good. They tend to create excitement. I really do think they're great. They're great things but they're not proven yet, and we need to find the best way to use them. So where are we going with this? We wanna make sure that we have the right thing. So let me tell you about really the first technology that people got excited about in joint replacement, because it forms the basis for robotics. So this is navigation. If you look here on this model, you can see these little balls that the arrow's pointing to, which are the balls that the robot sees, they're photoreflective, and the, the blue arrow shows the camera, the red arrow's the balls, and the black area is the computer. And you need all three in order to do robotics or navigation, because this is the computer seeing the name. So this is what we do now for robotics, and this is what we previously did for navigation, which is a way to take tremendously precise measurements. So what has been found though with navigation is that it, we did make better cuts, but we didn't change the way that the patients felt. We spent more money, we took longer, but we really didn't make a difference in how our patients feel. So just navigating a need, just making more precise measurements as of today, has not made a substantial difference in how the patients feel. So what is a robot? Why would a robot do that? So, excuse me, a robot combines navigation with a device that actually can cut the bone or help the surgeon align how the bone is cut. So I'll show you what this looks like, but it is important to bear in mind that we, we can make a nicer looking knee with this but how do we be sure that we're doing better for our patients? 
first of all, a question I frequently get asked is does the robot do the surgery and the surgeon doesn't do anything? It's quite the opposite. Most robotics in medicine, whether it's the da Vinci robot, which is used for GYN surgery and prostate surgery and has been very popular, as well as our robots that we use in joint replacements, facilitate the surgeon doing what they think will be a better operation. But the surgeon still does the operation. And I'll show you what that's like. So we do not, you know, walk away from the table and let the robot work. It's not like that. So most of the robotic systems that are out there today, and I'll show you a number of them, have a way of making you, putting you in a position where you can make a cut through a slot, or in the case, you can see the slot here at the top with the saw blade through it. So the robot is actually this black thing and it can manipulate this slot. So when you use navigation with it, it goes ahead and, and produces a slot in just the right place to make what we consider to be or hope to be the perfect cut. And this is a robot guided saw, which instead of having a slot, the robot arm actually moves to the right location and then you make your cut in the right position. So once again, it's a navigated system, but then there's something to help you make the cut at the end. So you're not just measuring. So let's look at a couple of the robots that are available. You know, are we gonna see them at the Ace Hardware store? You know a green robot, a purple robot, and a red robot? Well, not quite, but there are a lot of different robots there. So the robot that really first came out in the United States was the Mako robot. And I wanna point out a couple things. <clears throat> first of all, it looks just like a navigation system. You can see the computer screen with pictures of the, of the knee that's being worked on. You can see the camera at the top with the two black circles. That's watching the knee. And you can see that now you add the piece that holds the saw in order to align properly with what's on the screen. <clears throat> this is a very similar system that has a navigated slot that instead of, the row, instead of the saw attaching here, it moves this navigated slot into position. Once again, camera up here, uh, computer here, and the robotic portion here. So it's just navigation plus. So there are big ones like this, they work very well. There's, this is, these are some different ones. This is one where there's actually the navigation uh, alignment units are actually attached to this burr. And as you work, once again, you have the navigation system with the camera and the screen, but the burr actually turns on and off as you move it into position. So this forces you to make the cut in the right place. And this is a new robot about to come out in the next few weeks, it's been approved. Navigation system, this is a much smaller robot, but it works, you can see barely on here, I apologize, I have better pictures coming up. But this is one with the saw attached. You can actually see the, the barely see the, the blade to the side, but I'll show you that better in the videos that I have. So, and then finally, these are some other ones. I showed you this one already on the right, the Omni. This has the navigated slot that moves. It attaches to the patient. You have the navigation screen over here, and you have this slot that can move that you cut through. This is the only autonomous robot. This has not been very popular yet. This is a very large machine. This one actually has a burr. You use the navigation system, you set it up, and you actually do walk away, and it, it, it burrs the bone and makes the fit for the prosthesis. So all of this is about getting the right fit for that prosthesis, which hopefully we hope, those of us who are advocates of this kind of technology, will then lead to a better outcome. So what are the steps for robotics? I showed you the steps for a, um, a non-robotic procedure in terms of using the jigs. This is a little different because you have to put, you have to expose the joint, you have to put these photo detectors on the joint. You then have to register, which basically shows the robot where to look for the knee. You then have the opportunity to adjust the position very precisely on a computer screen. And then the robot helps you make the cuts and you glue the implant in place. So this is an example of registration from one of the companies. 
showing the dots that you have to show the computer so that it knows where the bone is. I'll show you what this looks like. So this is registering the robot. So this is a technician working on a model. Once again, what do you see? You have the computer screen, which shows a foot on it right now because it's waiting. But basically, you have the robot parked off to the side now. This is the smaller robot. Here's the saw. This is not engaged yet. And what the technician is doing is taking this probe that has the photo detector arrays on it and touching various very critical points on the knee in order to develop the picture. You see the picture developing now on the screen. Now you can see the femur bone and it's showing various places that it wants to know about so that the robot can really know the knee and help the doctor then make adjustments and ultimately make the proper cuts. So basically this is, in the case of most of the robots now, this is a fairly quick process. It takes a couple of minutes to do this. And they keep, you know, this is the latest robot, so it has the fastest camera, so it's the fastest, but they keep leapfrogging each other, you know, and upgrading kind of like cell phones. They upgrade, but you see how it's getting different angles. Look at the picture on the top, and it's starting to develop that robot and verify that everything is in the proper orientation and location. So that's the, um, that's the first step which is let the robot know where the knee is. And then we have these very precise ways. So this is the screen that you're looking at next. So this would show a model of the knee and the, you can see the metal pieces already being fit on the outside of the, of the piece. It's kind of like what the engineers do when they build a bridge and they computer model it and they can see the tensions and the ligaments here on the side. And actually, all of these numbers are active. And the surgeon, with all these systems, can make adjustments to fit this implant in just the right. And so you can see here, here's, the, uh, here's that view again. And in this case, the surgeon has now already adjust, I'm sorry, has already registered the knee so the robot knows it. And notice as he moves, the position of the bone moves. And he's now developed by moving the knee, the range of motion of the knee and the position. So now he's going to make his adjustments to adjust that knee implant so he feels like it's in the optimum position to fit the patient. You can make it bigger, you can go smaller, you can adjust it upward, you can rotate it. So this is what we do during the surgery in order to optimize the position of the implant. Now, does a surgeon who doesn't use a computer do this? Yes. I showed you on the initial pictures how they make lots of measurements and they make their adjustments in that way. Can we say that the robot's going to be better? Not yet, but that's, you know, we feel like a robot is an advancement and hopefully in the long run, we'll find the best way using a robot to demonstrate that it works. And here they are now swinging the robot in and getting ready to use the saw. So it's not a complicated process. And here's the saw. So now you take the saw in your hand, but the saw is captured and it won't let you cut the bone to make the position for the implant. Notice the bone is on the top and it's showing you exactly where you're cutting. All of the robots work roughly the same in this regard. And the doctor can take the saw, they're all a little different, but the doctor can say, take the saw and make the cut in the proper position. So you notice here, and what you don't see is that he's moving the saw, but the robot is actually guiding it to stay in the proper position. Notice the robot moving now. He hit the pedal, the robot moves to the next cut. No jigs, you know, no fiddling with pins and moving things onto the robot, onto the bone. He pushes the pedal and the robot goes to the next spot and makes the next cut. And when he gets done, it will have fully machined and fashioned that implant to fit the, to fit the uh, implant. So it will have fashioned the end of the bone. So let's watch him here for just a minute as we see the various cuts that we make with a saw, in this case on a plastic bone, in order to properly fit an implant. So you have to cut the front, the back, You'll see he's going to cut what we call the chamfers. 
So when he gets done cutting the back here, he'll hit the pedal. And the next thing that happens is it'll move to the next position. Here we go. And it'll cut again. And if the, if the leg happens to move a little during the surgery, the machine will follow where the leg's moving. And if it moves too much, so here we're gonna make the next cut. You notice the robot moves by itself, goes to the next cut. So there's many variations of this. I showed you six different systems. They all work similarly, but they all work um, slightly different. So let's take a look at this picture. So now we have practice prostheses, we call them trials and we're gonna fit them in there. And once again, notice as he moves, the robot is watching, and it's gonna give him a tremendous amount of data about how the knee balances, whether we can achieve the range of motion that we'd like, and how the ligaments are looking. So this is what we do every day in surgery, honestly, whether we use a robot or not. So that's an introduction to robotics in orthopedic surgery. So do the robots really make a difference for the patient who's there? Well, so far we really don't know. There's many studies. Robots have been in use for hip replacements, knee replacements, and partial knee replacements for many years. They're certainly more accurate, meaning they can make their cuts in exactly the place we would like them to. But as of today, although I love robotics and I love the feedback that it gives me as a surgeon, I can't look you in the eye and say that it's absolutely proven that a patient with a robotic knee is going to do better than what our very experienced surgeons, 70% in the United States, who don't use robotics. I think robotics are ultimately going to give us an avenue toward a better knee or a better hip, but we can't prove that yet. So what's the problem? Well, there's a lot of different kind of robots. There's a lot of different kind of technologies. There isn't 100% agreement about the best way to do a robotic knee or to do a knee in general. But my belief is if we don't try it, then how do we get better at it? Our existing technology, we know the problems, the new technology, bear in mind, if you're one of those people who wants the new technology, there's a good chance it may be better, but there's also a good chance it may not be, or it may be worse. So bear that in mind. You need to do some research if you're contemplating these. Speak to doctors who do them and those who don't, and try to get an honest viewpoint as to whether it's truly better. What's my thought on robotics? And this is me, this is very biased. But we're studying them. We think that we're gonna achieve better results. We believe in the technology but that hasn't been shown yet. And maybe even the ways we're doing it now need to be improved to really make that difference. So it's not just that we haven't proven it, it's that maybe there are different ways we need to develop that have not yet been developed. Cost is an issue, it is an expensive procedure. Most of those costs are borne by the healthcare system, which you may not be paying directly, but we all pay indirectly. Who should be using this and who, what patient should be choosing it? Well, be, be aware of the fact that if you do something new, you are also taking a little more risk for the potential for gain. So you need to decide if that's something you want to do. I don't advise people to have robotics or not. I do an awful lot of it, but I also do replacements still without the robot for a variety of reasons. And some people request that we do them without the robot for the reason that if it's not proven you know, very, very well, they don't wanna take that chance. So a plug for the Rothman Institute, we've been committed to these types of technologies, doing navigation for over 15 years, over 10 years of doing various types of robotics and other computer guided techniques for joint replacements. We've already published a number of studies but you know, they're, they're early studies. They're studies based upon a few years. They're based upon secondary data, things like do the x-rays look better? Do the, you know, do the measurements we take look better? You know, is there less, you know, uh, what type of technology do we have to use with it? 
Are there risks to the procedure? But you know, the holy grail is really going to be, do we have patients smiling who are telling us that their knees are doing fantastic? And instead of 80% of the time, they're doing it 90 and 95% of the time. So I hope you found this interesting. I covered a lot of territory in 35 minutes, including how to do a robotic knee, but don't, don't forget that still more than half the knees in this country are done successfully by orthopedic surgeons without robotics. But people like us at the Rothman Institute and other educational centers are always going to lead the way in finding the latest techniques and developing the best way to do a replacement, whether that's a new pain control technique so that you can get through the surgery and the recovery with a smile on your face, better implants that are gonna last longer, and as in my case, the robotics, which I love to work with, but we have over 30 full-time joint surgeons, and many of them are working on a variety of ways to improve the way your joint replacement can be done. So I'm gonna stop sharing, and if there's any questions, I see we have a couple. We can go ahead and, and go ahead and ask the question. So I think we're gonna have Natalie ask the question for us and we'll go ahead and uh, go from there. Sure. So the first question is what, what types of knees do you use? Have there been any problems with the knees? Well, you know, there's about four major manufacturers who make knee replacements and then a number of others. I have generally used the major manufacturers, which are uh, Stryker, Johnson & Johnson, which is also called Depew, uh, Zimmer Biomat, <clears throat> Smith & Nephew to a degree because they have some interesting implants. Those are the major names. I'm not here to advertise for them. I think they're all quality companies. Have there been problems? Every company's had problems. You know, any new manufactured device can have problems that occur occasionally, which might be an individual manufacturing problem that happened a day or two on the assembly line versus uh, a problem that's been consistent where a lot of joints have had to be taken out. Generally, my policy is to use the big companies that use that uh, make knee replacements because I believe their quality control is excellent and they're very much vested in long term when they'll be around. To have, their knee, to have their knees be successful, or hips or shoulders. So I think I ha can't say that one is fantastic and another is not, and I don't see huge differences between these very high quality companies. Next question. Okay. Next question is in the chat box. If you are bow-legged, can you still get a knee replacement? Yes, I have some great pictures that I wish I could show you, but most of our patients who are bow-legged, and that's the most common deformity that we see before a knee replacement, they will have their knees straightened fundamentally by the surgery. Now, one of the things we've learned though is if somebody's a little bow-legged when they're born and they get very bow-legged as their knee wears out, we probably don't wanna make them perfectly straight because that's not the way they were meant to be. And that's called constitutional varus. That means that they were really meant to be a little bow-legged. So I leave them a little bow-legged, but you'll see when you look at people's ex, I'm sorry, their pictures of their knees, I don't have them here to show you, it's a dramatic improvement. And most of our patients actually start bow-legged, although we do treat all the different deformities. Okay, next question. How do you know a, re a replacement has to be taken out and replaced? So we call that a revision when the replacement has to be done over. And a revision means that something is worn out or maybe something went wrong. So in the late stages of a revision, it's usually because the plastic's wearing out and you find out about that one of two ways. Either the patient comes in as having swelling and pain and then you take an x-ray. And a lot of times that means there's even more damage being done because it's maybe been 20 years. The other way you find out is if you're having appointments with your doctor every few years and taking x-rays to monitor. I recommend x-rays every five years, you know, once the knee gets a little older. And if we start to see some signs of wear and tear, we'll keep an eye on that. And we wait, we don't want the, the, the knee or the hip to wear all the way through where it's 
metal on metal hitting because the uh, we've lost that washer in between. So that's the most common reason. Late early stage revisions are usually because something went wrong. So if you've had a knee replacement and now it's been maybe a year and it's starting to swell and become painful, that may mean that the knee has come loose. It didn't adhere well. Uh, one of the common things is you maybe you developed an infection. Maybe you got sick. I had a patient who had COVID, was in the intensive care unit. His knee was two years old and he developed an infection just from probably his resistance being res reduced and he had to have his knee taken out. So it can be something short-term or long-term. Hopefully most of our patients are coming back 20 years later for a revision, not two years. Okay. Next question. Um, I had one knee replaced with robotics. It is good except for the skin sensitivity. The skin feels weird whenever I walk. How often does this happen? And would you expect to have the same issue? Well, robotics don't change that because that's a function of the nerves of the skin that are near the incision. And basically, virtually any incision you make in, in a person's skin, you're gonna cut some little tiny nerves that are about the, the, the size of a hair filament. And those nerves do tend to leave numb areas. And as they heal, they feel really funny. It's kind of like hitting your funny bone. About 20% of patients really find this to be a little bit annoying. Many of them it resolves with time, but a lot of patients will have a weird feeling in that area forever. And that can be on a hip or a knee or in many other places. And it's not related to robotics. It's simply related to making the incision. So there are medications if you're very sensitive to try to make it a little bit more comfortable, but that's less than 1% of patients that need that. Do you do robotic knee replacement? And if so, what percentage of your implants are done robotically? Okay, so we discussed this a little bit uh, during the talk, but certainly I'm happy to answer that. So in my practice today, I do about two thirds of my knee replacements with robotics about a third with navigation, which is simply a computer measurement technique that is half of the robotic technique. And that's because we're waiting for an upgrade on that system. And I mentioned two thirds, one third, but actually there's probably about 10% that either the patient doesn't want to have the, um, the robotics, or some of our patients are at outpatient centers having knee replacements now, and they haven't that technology hasn't been introduced in those particular centers. And we're, mo we're monitoring these patients for their outcomes to see whether there are differences. But since I don't know as of today, if a patient with a knee replacement who has robotics is really gonna do better than somebody without, I prefer robotics because I, the technology appeals to me. But once again, that doesn't mean it's better. And so I'm comfortable with it. I think it's in development. I think my patients are doing very well with it, but I don't know if they're better yet. Okay. What is the usual hospitalization time barring no complications and when can you start driving? Okay, so if you're talking about a knee and we can talk about hips or knees, <clears throat> but if you're talking about a knee, that's very much patient dependent. So I don't tell patients when to start driving again with a knee replacement. I just remind them that if they're having their right knee replaced, that they have to use that knee to drive and they need to make sure that they're feeling strong enough and safe enough in order to drive. And if they don't feel sure, they shouldn't do it. So for a knee replacement on a right knee, I would say a patient who's doing very well may start driving after three or four weeks, but that's fairly early. Many of them are waiting six weeks or more. For a left knee replacement, of course, that's not your driving leg. So I tell the patients to have to drive when they're not taking any strong painkillers like narcotic so that they are not really driving impaired. And when they feel comfortable enough that they can be attentive enough to go ahead and drive. So I tell them to be careful, but many of them may start driving in a couple of weeks for a left knee. Okay. And what is the recovery time when compared with standard knee replacements? Is it the same? It should be. As of today, we would say it's the same. You know, there's no reason to think that with what we've done now, that patients are going to get better faster. 
there is some thought that maybe a patient will get better faster because the knee function mimics the natural better, but that's only a theory. So I would say to patients, once again, if you read about the technology and it appeals to you, you know, research it, see if that's something you want. I've had patients come in and say, look, I looked at robotics and I realized the state of the art is good, but it isn't necessarily better. And you've been doing part, uh, knee replacements without it for over 30 years. I'd rather have a regular one. By the way, it is the same implant. It doesn't change what we use. It only changes once we get inside how we do it. How about the infection rates? Um, do they differ when compared to standard knees? Not as far as we know. You know, infections are something in knee replacements that are very worrisome and they're hard to cure. And there's all kinds of data about whether they're half a percent or 1% or 2%. And that can vary with your health problems. They can get up over 5% if you have a lot of other serious health problems that affect your legs. But as far as we have seen so far, there's no difference in the infection rate between a standard knee and a, and a robotic knee, because actually it's really the same operation. It's just how we make our measurements and how we position the saw. Okay, well that brings to the next question. Does the surgery take longer when compared with a standard knee replacement? You, you know, a lot of the time factors depend upon the surgeon and how fast they take just in general doing a knee. I would say having done a lot of robotic knee replacements that it is slightly longer. You know, is that 10%, is that 25%? Um, that's a good question. It depends a lot on the surgeon and their degree of familiarity with it, as well as it depends upon the amount of how bad your knee is. You know, a knee can take twice as long if there's more work that needs to be done and more reconstruction. Now the robotic companies, and granted they're trying to sell robots, say, well, yeah, but if you look at the overall on knee replacements, because of the fact that a robotic procedure is more precise and measures better, maybe you don't have to make late adjustments. In other words, you put all the trials on, you, you think the knee's good and you check it with a regular knee, and it doesn't fit quite how you like it, so you have to adjust and use a different size implant. I still think there's a slight robotic time penalty. That's, I think, where we are right now. Not everybody agrees with that, but that's what my experience will tell me, just in time. Okay, and how do you decide on the best implant for the patient? It, does it determine their age, their activity level, the weight of the patient, and how long does the average implant last? Well, as this questioner asks, you know, probably these all come into account. You know, there's certainly situations where we know implants are at greater risk. And there's been a lot of advertising over the years from companies, once again, with new technology that may or may not be that well proven, looking at things like female knees, uh, custom knees, you know, and a lot of these things have yet to be proven that they're truly better. Years ago, there was a lot of what we call the high flex knees, which were designed in order to provide better flexion for patients, meaning you could bend your knee further. By the way, developed for the market over in the Asian countries where there's a lot more kneeling for praying and kneeling in general. Uh, a lot of this hasn't been borne out. I will say though that we do modify our implants for serious abnormalities in the knee. So if somebody has a lot of bone loss, we may have to use pegs or stems or wedges. With somebody who has a lot of deformity where the ligaments are damaged, there are pins that are used to better stabilize the knee. So having a surgeon with a lot of experience who's aware of all the different types of implants, I think is something that may benefit a patient with a very bad knee. And you know, this is something that Obviously, we do such a high volume of knee replacements in our facilities that we are very comfortable that we may have to say to a patient, you know, this isn't going to take just this regular knee that I have a model on on my desk. I may have to use some additional devices as part of the knee replacement that may make it a little better. The other thing is, you know, we're working through the 
non-cemented versus uh, information. So we know that you know some patients are still having their knees glued in place, and other patients are having them done without glue. Many surgeons are using both, but it's probably better suited, at least so far, we're more comfortable using it in patients who have pretty good bone, and you know we know that the bone is going to hold the implant, and we're hopeful that that may provide a more durable fit and fixation. But just like robotics, we know they're safe, but we don't know yet whether they're better. So there's a lot of factors we take into account. And I, I would just say to you, you know, go to somebody who's experienced with dealing with more difficult types of knee replacements if you're somebody who has a, a situation where the knee is looking like it might be more complicated. Okay, and how about the quad sparing? Do you do, do, you do quad sparing? So quad sparing is a very interesting and controversial technology. So this is the technology that's often advertised as we don't cut the tendon. And that means that instead of going through the main tendon that runs up the front of your thigh, which is called the quadriceps tendon, you actually cut to the side and you work a little more from the side. Now the potential advantages that are advertised are that there's a faster recovery and that the patients can get back to their functional uh, use of their knee more quickly. Some people also claim that there's less pain with a quad sparing knee. I do happen to do that technique because I was taught it 20 years ago, and I think it's a good way to put a knee replacement in. But as I sit here today after 20 years, I'm told by my physical therapist that my patients get better quickly and that they do well. But is that just us putting the knee in properly? Does that really reflect a quad sparing knee? And numerous studies have shown that if you take a group of surgeons who do quad sparing knees versus those who don't, it really doesn't show a huge difference. So is it really just, you know, better surgeons do better surgery or is it, you know, some nuance of this technique? But I would say to patients, if you want quad sparing, you can go out and find it but it's not something that we really push as a technique that's better. It's just another way that a surgeon might choose to do surgery in a way that he or she is comfortable. Okay, thank you. One of your patients is on. He said you replaced his hip yesterday. Thank you. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Unfortunately, uh, joint replacement surgeons live for this, much to the uh, chagrin of my kids and my family. But, <laughs> But it is, it is a very satisfying procedure, and it's really satisfying that a lot of our patients come back and tell us how much we change their lives. And we're very fortunate to be doing something that is so successful. I take my hat off to many of my colleagues who do much more difficult types of surgery where the patient outcomes are not as certain, you know, in cancer surgery or other things like that. And it takes really a special person to do that type of work. Amazing. There's a couple of more questions. Um, I know we're running low on time, um, so we'll, we'll give a few more if that's okay. Um, somebody asks if you can explain knee replacement revision and what that means. Okay, so a revision knee replacement is like putting new hinges on your door when they've come loose. So you know how the screws start to come loose and you tighten them a couple times, and after a while, the screws become not good enough. They're not big enough. Well, the same is with a knee replacement revision. Most knee replacement revisions, you're taking out the two major pieces. That's the top femur piece and the bottom tibia piece. So you literally remove it. Many times you're taking them out because they're loose or they're worn out. So you remove them from the surface of the bone. Well, what happens then? Well, you leave a bigger opening. So just like the hinge on your door, you've got to use a bigger screw to make the hinge solid. So what we have is we have first time replacements, which, are, which have smaller pins and lugs to hold them in place. And we have second time replacements, which have longer rods and sometimes metal sleeves or metal cones, which can attach to the bone and we can glue or press the implant into these cones. So basically, if you remember my picture of the knee replacement with about an inch and a half post on the bottom, we may end up with a three or four inch post in there. And we can create the same surface with the plastic 
the polyethylene and the metal surfaces that are smooth. But understand if your first knee compared with your natural knee that you had when you were 20, which was an A plus, your, your knee replacement we hope is like an A minus, a second replacement may be a B or a B plus because now you have more scar tissue, you've taken out more of the bone and the implant has to work a little harder to support you. So it's a good thing if you need it, but you certainly don't wanna to have too many knee replacements in your life unless you really need to. Okay, and on that, um, does the clicking of the knee getting worse, is that an indication that a revision is needed? Not necessarily, but it can be. It is a sign that could be something as simple as a little scar tissue, and that isn't serious at all. It can simply be a little noise from the surfaces hitting up against each other in certain positions, or it could be a sign that something's coming loose. Other things to look out for would be pain and swelling and heat, which may indicate along with the clicking that the, that the, the machinery is not working the way we'd like it to. But you know, your pathway is always, if you have something you're concerned about, go see the orthopedic surgeon for a checkup and let them take some x-rays and reassure you as to whether it's working properly or not. Okay. Do you perform more one-stage hip replacements like I underwent versus the standard two-stage? Or um, that, would be an, that would be a procedure for infection. So one-stage means you go in and try to clean it out as well as possible on one operation and then glue in usually another prosthesis and you pack it with antibiotics and you treat the patient with antibiotics and that's the surgery. And you hope that's gonna be successful. That has been gaining in popularity, but it is not 100% adhered to yet. And in this country, we do more two stages where we take out the implant, clean it out real good, pack it with antibiotics, leave it for about three months, could be different times, could be two months, and then go back in and put the new prosthesis in. And that is a good way to treat infections. One stage is gaining in popularity. We're not 100% sure yet. We're not 100% sure who can use this. One of our doctors uh, in our group does a lot of one stage revisions. He's somebody who's really expert at them. And he's really looking very carefully to see if this is something that will be ideal for patients. The advantage being it's only one operation. So stay tuned, you know, at the Rothman Institute, we are committed to finding the best techniques and, and researching them and proving them so that some of the newer things we're using will become the standard in the future. Absolutely. Um, regarding hip replacements, um, someone asks, do you make the incision on the front, back, or the side? Okay, so all three ways are very much accepted. The kind of hot one now, which has been for a number of years, is the anterior, which means it's made with a cut in the front. You know, there's different literature on this and different studies, one from the Mayo Clinic, that suggests maybe the anterior hip surgery, the patient gets better a little faster, but you know, after a few months, it's not a big difference. You know, studies of complications are no longer showing a big difference among all of these techniques. So I prefer the anterior. My, my personal impression is that the patients do a little better in my hands. And I think, you know, a lot of our patients like the anterior. But, you know, once again, the differences are probably not huge. And we have many fine posterior and lateral hip replacement surgeons in the Delaware Valley and even within our own practice. Okay. Somebody asks if we'll be doing a presentation on hip replacement robotics. So. Undoubtedly, we will. Part of the reason we chose knees is they're just more popular for robotics right now. And I think the robotic hip surgery offerings are more in their infancy. So, you know, we're right out on the cutting edge. We have, I have a robotic hip replacement system at uh, one of my hospitals. And we also use computer navigation for hips. You know, is this going to be the answer? You know, if you want to find out, stay tuned to some of our webinars because we will certainly be talking about them. And the thing is, we will have people get up who have a lot of experience with them. Absolutely. 
And so one last question, if a posterior hip replacement is done, should the affected leg be a little bit longer? It's certainly not unusual that it could be a little bit longer. You know, we've seen patients who have huge differences in their leg lengths to start, and we can't fully correct them. But also, you know, making the implant fit and be stable with all the muscles, tendons, and ligaments may result in a leg that's sometimes a little bit longer. Plus, your leg may be longer because you have a little scoliosis, you have a crooked knee, you have a collapsed ankle from arthritis. So it's impossible, even with, I use a computer system for this, and even with the computer system, it doesn't come out perfectly. And this doesn't mean to say that I'm a computer guy. You probably figured that out. That doesn't mean to say that mine are any better than the other surgeon. And we have, you know, plenty of male and female surgeons who do these through all kinds of different technologies. Um, we haven't beat the patients feeling like the leg is longer or shorter yet because there's so many factors that go into it. My guess is we won't until we get to machine learning and augmented reality which by the way, are coming. So stay tuned. All right. Okay, well, I think we're out of time here. Um, if anybody has any questions um, after, you know, after we end tonight, um, you can feel free to email us at marketing at rothmanortho.com. And I'm happy to you know, get your questions answered. Um, if anybody does want to make an appointment with Dr. Starr at any of his office locations, our phone number is 1-800-321-9999. And our website is rothmanortho.com. You can always go on there to, um, to view our physicians, our locations, and, and different services that we offer. So thanks so much for, for attending, and thank you so much, Dr. Starr, for your excellent presentation tonight. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone has a great night.